Hello, I'm Dr. Brian Cole from Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. And over the next several minutes, I'd like to present the case for rotator cuff augmentation. We know that rotator cuff tears have a significant economic impact on our healthcare system. In 2021 alone, there will likely be more than 500,000 rotator cuff repairs performed each year. This accounts for at least $5 billion per year in medical costs, benefits, and lost productivity. Despite improvements in biomechanical repair constructs, anatomic failure remains common with incremental costs and disability associated with that failure. So our thesis is that the use of an extracellular matrix augmentation at the time of primary rotator cuff repair is economically cost-effective and improves clinical outcomes and healing rates. Now, rotator cuff tears occur due to multifactorial etiologies. Re-tears are associated with reduced strength, satisfaction, and revision surgery. And the role of extracellular matrix augmentation is to augment the initial repair construct to improve the mechanical strength and provide additional biology in an already biologically challenging environment to enhance the repair, ultimately leading to anatomic intact state at one year follow-up or more. The economic impact of graft augmentation at the time of rotator cuff repair does pose a significant upfront cost. And we need to ask ourselves, is it cost effective and where does it actually make sense? As part of this thesis, understanding why rotator cuff tears happen is actually pretty important. Certainly a subset occurs through traumatic etiologies, and that may involve more healthy tissue, but what's more common is atraumatic rotator cuff tears. And the intrinsic theory really supports the fact that there are age-related decreases in vascularity. We see chronic degenerative changes, collagen disorganization, fatty infiltration, myxoid degeneration. All of these things eventually lead to rotator cuff tears. There are a number of biologic challenges associated with rotator cuff disease age, chronicity, the number of tendons involved, the vitamin D status of a patient, bone density, history of smoking, diabetes, or inflammation. This speaks to the fact why re-tears actually happen. We have deteriorating biology. Every decade of life, we see more and more rotator cuff tears. Suffice it to say, improving the environment at the time of rotator cuff repair actually may make sense, especially when some of these comorbidities exist. What we're trying to achieve is emphasis regeneration. This is basically the tendon to bone interface with fibrocartilage repair. Unfortunately, what we get is often reactive scar tissue and a failure to develop the mineralized fibrocartilage matrix associated with the normal emphasis. It probably happens because we see inflammation and fibrosis rather than true tissue regeneration. All of these factors lead to the weak link and ultimately probably relate to how re-tears happen at long-term follow-up. Now, the incidence of re-tears ranges between zero and 95%, and the majority have happened in the first six months. The initial healing at the tendon bone interface remains the weak link, and the anatomic integrity plays a very important role in outcomes. What we've learned is that functional outcomes are directly related to the intact state of the rotator cuff. Obviously, the need for revision surgery happens with deteriorated clinical outcomes that occur in six months and one year or beyond with rotator cuff failure. The literature supports that there are improved outcomes and function in a healed rotator cuff compared to an asymptomatic re-tear. We also know that improved mechanical repair constructs, such as the double row and the transosseous equivalent repair, have led to lower retear rates. But there are biologic limitations that are present, as we've discussed, and the remaining hurdle is providing a more normal histologic tendon bone interface and improving our outcomes due to this degenerative tissue pathology. Now, we know that retear rates range between 0 and 95%, and the majority of these retears occur in the first six months. And the weak link is the tendon bone interface. We've done a good job of time equals zero biomechanical constructs by utilizing double row and transosseous equivalent repairs, but we still have a number of biological limitations as we discussed. So the premise is that we can augment our repairs with extracellular matrix patches, and that increases the mechanical strength of the initial construct based upon what we know in the literature. It also improves the biologic environment by improving intrinsic properties of the healing bone tendon unit. Today, dermal allografts are the most commonly used. They are associated with the greatest biomechanical properties, they are bioinductive, and they improve the biologic incorporation of the tendon bone interface. We also know that long-term incorporation occurs into the host tissues, increasing thickness and strength of the ultimate repair. In essence, extracellular matrix augmentation has led to lower retail rates and improved outcomes. In this canine study, the authors looked at 32 shoulders split into four groups and evaluated them at six months, debridement, amniotic matrix, human dermal allograft, and bovine collagen patches. And basically, the take-home was that human dermal grafts looked the best by MRI and histopathology. In this clinical study, the authors looked at 35 patients at two-year follow-up. 20 were relegated to the patch group and 15 to the non-augmented rotator cuff repair group. Both used medial row load-sharing techniques. There was a 26% retail rate in the control group versus a 10% in the patch group. They had significantly better PROs for the patch group versus the control group. 
Now, the economic burden of rotator cuff repair is significant. And as I mentioned, it's estimated to be at minimum $5 billion when you assume direct and indirect costs. Direct costs are the hospital and the surgeon fees, and they range between $7,500 and $13,000 per rotator cuff repair. And the indirect costs, including time lost, workers' compensation, subsequent clinic visits, the cost of physical therapy, the cost of a re-tear, and the cost of revision surgery are enormous. So contemplating using extracellular matrix augmentation at the time of rotator cuff repair has the potential to deliver a substantial economic benefit while improving clinical outcomes and healing rates. We performed a decision tree model for evaluating the cost effectiveness of extracellular matrix augmentation at the time of initial rotator cuff repair. This model divided the rotator cuff patients into two arms, those who were augmented and those who were non-augmented. And then each treatment arm was further divided into those that healed those that had asymptomatic re-tears, and those that had symptomatic re-tears. We also calculated arm transition probabilities that were pooled based upon information in the literature. Each endpoint had a subsequent cost and utility that was determined. So specifically, these are our cost assumptions. Rotator cuff repair with augmentation was approximately $16,000, and we assumed a graft implant cost of about $3,500. The cost of rotator cuff repair without augmentation was estimated to be about $12,500, that would be the same cost of revision rotator cuff repair without augmentation. These are numbers that are well established in the literature. We looked at utility measurements also from the literature. Based upon EQ5D scores in the literature for patients with a rotator cuff tear after a successful repair, we assumed that a healed rotator cuff repair had the same utility as a asymptomatic re-tear whether or not augmentation was used. We also assumed that a symptomatic re-tear had no utility. This article was used to determine transition probability analysis. We basically assumed that the retear rate was 2.4% with graft augmentation. The retear rate was 41% with non-augmentation. The asymptomatic retear rate was estimated to be 69%, and the symptomatic retear rate was conservatively estimated at 15%. And then finally, we determined the incremental cost-effective ratio, the ICER. This basically measured the incremental cost of extracellular augmentation per quality-adjusted life year. The literature supports a number of about $50,000 per quality adjusted life year to be determined to be cost effective. The formula is as seen here. Essentially what we did is we put the transition probability analysis, the utility and the cost effective inputs into this formula and the following outputs were determined. The results of our decision tree analysis are as follows. We showed that augmented repairs led to 2.29 quality improvement over a 10 year period at a cost of about $16,000. We then showed, in contrast, that non-augmented repairs led to a 2.05 quality improvement over 10 years at a cost of nearly $13,000. Our ICER score was about $14,000 per quality. That's well below the cost effectiveness cutoff of $50,000 that's been determined in the literature. This led to our conclusion that rotator cuff repair using extracellular matrix augmentation is cost effective based upon our decision tree analysis. We then performed a sensitivity analysis. It revealed two very interesting findings. We actually determined that the maximum cost of the extracellular matrix augmentation could be as high as nearly $12,000. Now that's well below the ICER threshold of $50,000, but the price that we utilized in our analysis was only $3,500, well below that $12,000 threshold. We then performed a threshold sensitivity analysis, and this basically showed that the reduction in retail rate that's needed for various graph costs to be cost effective, as you see here in this chart. So these are the conclusions from our analyses in our study. It's widely accepted that more than half of all shoulder surgeons have previously utilized a graft for rotator cuff repair augmentation. The literature also supports that extracellular matrix augmentation at the time of rotator cuff repair has improved biomechanical properties. It also has superior patient reported outcomes and healing rates compared to conventional rotator cuff repair without augmentation. The small cost savings of performing rotator cuff repair at the time of the index procedure does not account for lost quality or the need for revision surgery. An extracellular matrix augmentation now is highly cost effective and as per our study improves the number of qualities for individual patients who undergo augmentation at the time of rotator cuff repair. Coupled with our understanding of the challenging biologic environment that rotator cuff tears present, I think this is a time to actually consider more routine use of extracellular matrix augmentation at rotator cuff repair index surgery.